Thank you, Patricia Kenburn. Today, we inducted Pacific alumni, Matt De La Pena. We've been trying to get him here for years. <laughs> so we're very excited to have you here with us today. Um, I think we first talked about it like five years ago in a Phi Beta Kappa meeting. So this is a special honor. Phi Beta Kappa chapters may elect no more than three alumni to their membership each triennium. The alumni so honored graduated before our chapter existed and are those who have distinguished themselves in letters and science. Uh, Matt De La Pena graduated in 1996 with a degree in English. He also earned a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from San Diego State University. He is a New York Times best-selling author and a Newbery Medal winning author, uh, the first Latino to win the award. His books, job, <laughs> his books include Ball Don't Lie, Mexican White Boy, which was actually banned from Tucson schools as a result of state law that eliminated Mexican American studies courses. <laughs> Last Stop on Market Street and Love. His, his book Miguel and the Grand Harmony was released by Disney in both English and Spanish in October of 2017. And we welcome Matt De La Pena into the Kai chapter and he'll um, share a few words with us as well. Thank you. Matt. Thank you. Hello guys. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for having me in your space. Um, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank Susan Geraldes and Zhao Jing Zhu for nominating me. Um, I'm just going to share a couple thoughts with you about why I believe a liberal arts um, education is an ideal preparation for a career, but also a life. Um, and I want to talk about how it relates a little bit to writing a novel. So when you write a novel, you, you have this brand new idea, you're so excited about it, and you feel like you can carry this idea for 300 pages. And you're so excited. There's so much freedom and hope for this project to, to be fulfilled the way you envision it. You could do anything you want. Um, ultimate freedom. You can start with any sentence. You could choose any point of view. Um, you could be experimental with it, or you can play it more traditionally. All these things. And you set off to work. And at some point, you realize that it's really hard. <laughs> and um, it's difficult, and it's a challenge. And I think what makes it hard is the same thing that makes it amazing. It's the freedom. It's all the um, anxiety, the unfulfilled promise of it. So it turns out freedom can be scary and freedom can be paralyzing. When I'm working with new writers, eventually during the process of their own novel writing, they'll come to me and they'll say, I'm stuck. I'm in the middle. I don't know what happens next. And what if I make a wrong move and, and I mess up the whole book, the whole promise of this thing. And here's the secret that I've learned um, that I tell them. And this is so simple, but I say the answers are in the text. And so what that means is if you are halfway through a novel and you go back and look what you have, you will actually discover all these little seeds for what comes next. They're very small but you'll discover them and it helps you move forward. So it's similar um, when, you're, when you're a person living a life. So let's talk about that for a second. By the way, this is what makes novel writing to me a living, breathing thing. You know, it's sort of evolving as you go. When I left UOP, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I discovered <clears throat> a love of writing here um, I thought maybe I could try to become a writer. I didn't know if I really could though because I was what I considered an average ordinary person. Could, could an average person really write a book? So I didn't know what I was going to do. I first got a job at a group home in San Jose. And while I was working there, I learned so much about the world. First of all, I met these kids who had been marginalized because something they had done. And I noticed interesting things. The residents in the group home were 99% brown. 
and then I would go to a more academic function, and it would be mostly white. So I was just noting these things. And then most of the kids I really liked. They'd done something to get in trouble, but they were good kids. They made mistakes running with the wrong crowd, but occasionally there'd be one kid, and I'd be like, I just don't like this kid. He doesn't treat the other residents well. He doesn't listen to directions. He's not a good kid. Well, in this job, you stayed there for three and a half days and you slept in the office. And what I would do every night is I'd read their files. And this kid who, who I thought of as not a good kid, I'd read his file and I'd go, oh my gosh, look at what happened to this young person from the age of seven to 11. How is he even still alive, let alone a good kid? What that taught me is that every person you interact with there's all this background that you don't know about. So I try to now give people the benefit of the doubt and allow them to have some space in how they interact with me. But it also led me to write a book called We Were Here, which in my opinion is my best book. By the way, you're not supposed to have a favorite novel as a writer, it's against the rules, but I do. Just like I have a favorite child. Um, <laughs> but again, so I had that experience, and the answers were in the text. So I wrote about it. I wrote it as a way to figure out what I felt about this. From there, I ended up going to San Diego State to get my MFA degree. I remember I left UOP, and I remember I'd go to practice sometimes, and I'd be with my teammates who I loved so much. But they thought I was weird, because I wrote poetry in the Pacifican and because I had won this writing contest, and because I saw what they considered crazy independent films like Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember thinking, well, when I get to my master's program, I'll be among my people. It'll be writers, um, creative people. I'll finally find my, my home. So I remember in the first big meeting of all the MFA students, it was similar to this, there were folding chairs. I sat in the back and I was like, wow, this is, it feels so good. And I noticed that there were two young women kind of glancing back at me um, and I was like, wow, I'm already getting attention here. Um, international relationships. No, um, so, <laughs> but, but then um, I overheard one of them say, to her friend, since when are we letting jocks in here? And I was like, oh, okay. So I sort of understood from that point on that in the basketball world, I was considered a creative writer. In the creative writing world, I was considered a basketball player. And at first, it frustrated me. But what I learned to realize, the best position to record the world from is on the fringes. So again, the answers are in the text. So. I realized that there was no better position to be a writer than just a little on the outside where you can fully observe things subjectively. It's actually difficult to write about something when you're dead center in a group. From there, I moved to Los Angeles and I got a job at MTV. Um, I worked on a reality TV show and I'm here to tell you that reality TV is not real. Um, <laughs> but I remember when I got there, uh, I, you know, I was like, this is not really what I want to be doing because right now we're just you know, recording what happens and this is a trend in TV that I don't really love. But I found out an interesting thing. Even on a reality TV show, there is a story writer. Isn't that strange? Isn't that counterintuitive? So there's somebody who takes the raw footage and molds story out of it. And what I realized from that is even stuff that is quote unquote real, has to be molded into a proper narrative. And from that point on, I realized that not only do you have to do that in books, not only do you have to do that in speaking engagements, but every political campaign is a narrative. Every interaction with a human being is a form of narrative. We are built on narrative. And so it really informed the way I approach not only my books, but my interactions with the public. So again, the answers are in the text. And then last, I made a move to um, another job. I worked at a subtitle company. 
Um, and this was a very strange thing because we basically translated, if you can use that word here, translated English TV shows and movies into English. Does that make sense? It doesn't sound like it makes sense, but here's the thing. You can hear more information quicker than you can read it, right? So before it goes to the other languages, you have to first sort of fit it into a textual English. So you had to truncate 20% of everything that was happening on screen. Well, the interesting thing about that is you had to, there was an art to it. You had to maintain the integrity of the joke. You had to keep all the plot points that were gonna resonate later or pay off later. So I learned the art of revision um, and, and sort of being efficient with language. Well, then I moved to New York City and I began my career as, as an author. Well, guess what? The main thing I think I'm skill, my main skill as a writer is being able to be efficient and quick with language. Um, when I won the Newbery Award, the, I, I got to go to a dinner with all the members who chose the book. And every one of them made comment on the efficiency of language. So again, there was just a job that I was taking because I was poor but it actually paid off in my career. So for each of us here, um, one of the best parts about the liberal arts education is that you have freedom. One of the scariest parts about having a liberal arts education is you have freedom. So I would just urge you to be curious and follow your curiosity and always use what comes before. This is one of my favorite lines for writing, but it, it applies to a career too. Do not hurry, do not rest. And I love that idea, not only for a writing, but for, as you pursue your the next steps. And the answers are in the text. And I wish you well on your journey and the story you are all going to tell with your lives. So thank you very much.